Welcome and good morning, Methow Calvary Chapel Fellowship. We are in Matthew chapter 7 today, and um, we spoke last week about the first five verses, judge not lest ye be judged, and that is uh, something that each of us needs to uh, ruminate on occasionally and make sure that we are in the point of obedience to God and not trying to stand in the place of God, standing as a judge for God. Uh, we, we spoke about that from James chapter 5 last week, or James chapter 4, excuse me. I'll start again before we read the passage um, with what I opened with last week, the highest level of accomplishment, the highest level of Christian accomplishment, the highest level of Christian honor, the highest level of Christian respect towards God or ownership in your faith is, is not to stand in God's place as the judge. The highest level of Christian accomplishment, the highest level of honor and respect towards God is simply to obey his word. There'll be a couple times in Matthew chapter 7, um, maybe once, and it's in my mind a couple different places from the scriptures, um, that uh, there is lawlessness abounding. Uh, they will declare them, uh, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Uh, that's self-willed, that's antinomianism. And so if we are practicing lawlessness, we are clearly not practicing obedience. They're antithesis to each other. And so as we look at this, Jesus, I believe, is trying to um, wake up, if you will, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the lawyers, the hypocrites that were there in the crowd that he was speaking to, and at the same time, he's trying to draw them into a relationship with himself, draw them into a saving faith, as well as the people who weren't the hypocrites and the lawyers, the people who were the sick and, and uh, the tax collectors and those who knew they needed a savior. And Jesus was speaking to all of them. But in chapter 7, uh, when he starts off with, judge not lest ye be judged, I think he is really pointing to the Pharisees, to the scribes and the hypocrites. Um, and today, you know, that's if, if you're a showy Christian or a competitive Christian, if you're a, a Corinthian super apostle Christian, if you're part of the new apostolic reformation that everything is about sign gifts and signs and wonders and miraculous things, then you really need to examine what the scriptures has to say in light of that sort of mindset, because it's not about your approval by man or how you can show off before people. Um, the commandment is very simply, as 1 Timothy 1, 5 says, now the purpose of the commandment is love, right? Love does no evil, does no wrong. It does for others what you would expect them what you'd hope they would do for you. The purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, not a covetous heart, not serving mammon instead of God. The purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and from sincere faith, a faith that is true and a conscience that you can really check your conscience and say, am I, do I, do these things? Am I doing these things? Because I want to serve God. I want to love God and love my fellow person. Or is there an agenda uh, like a wolf in sheep's clothing? So we see that there's a purpose for the commandment. The law came and it was to, to show God's love and, and mercy and a, a pure heart. Now for the Pharisees, when Jesus says, judge not lest ye be judged, they probably went in their heart, well, Jesus, then why do we have the law? Isn't the law there for us, the law keepers, the law interpreters, to put our finger on the law and point our index at the sinner and say, you are breaking the law? What about the law? And so Jesus is going to let them know that if they are putting themselves in the position of a judge, they most likely are lawless, and they're the ones breaking the law. For all people are guilty 
of breaking God's law, as Jesus points out, if you've looked with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. If you're angry with your brother without cause, you are in danger of judgment. He lays out these different things in chapter 5 that lays all, all people guilty before God. And thus, we just need a Savior. We need to stop judging, stop being critical, stop pointing fingers. Remember that old saying, when you point one finger at someone else, three are pointed back at you. And we just need to remember that with the same judgment that we judge, it will be measured back to us. So let's read those first five verses, then we'll jump into verse six and exegete the passage from there. But in mind, um, the highest level of Christian accomplishment is obedience, is walking in the love towards God. And the Pharisees were probably thinking, we have to judge, we've got the law. Judge not that you not be judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And why you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let re me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And so Jesus, of course, is giving this illustration, trying to get people to not be critical, <laughs> self, you know, judgmental, uh, setting self-standards that everyone else is supposed to live by. And we talked about that last week. And then he rolls into this exhortation. And, and it's kind of interesting where it's at. Was there a pause? And then he began a new subject. You know, in the New King James Bible, there will be a, a paragraph uh, marker there, uh, and also verse 7. So is it a pause and, and a new thought, or is he rolling upon something? Or is he just turning at this point to the Pharisees and the scribes and the hypocrites, those, those, those people who are uh, portrayed for us today in the church, those people who, when you see them come and you're like, oh, no. We don't want to be those people. Anyways, with how you judge is how it's going to be measured back to you. So he says in verse 6, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Now, dogs are unclean. Swine are unclean in the, in the Jewish world. Um, 2 Peter 2, verse 22 talks about a dog returning to his vomit and a, and a swine uh, back to the mire after she's been washed. That's like these people who return back to their sin. Proverbs 26, 11 is where Peter gets that about the dogs. As a dog returns to his vomit, um, so is a fool to his folly. And, and don't know exactly who Jesus was talking to here, but possibly staring right into the face of, of Pharisees and, and saying to them, that uh, don't be dogs, don't be swine, because I have here some very wonderful pearls. Now, pearls uh, are, in the Hebrew vernacular, it's, um, the idea is when you have a, a string of wonderful verses put together, if we turn to Romans chapter, excuse me, <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, verse 10, we see, a, a pearl of, of uh, a string of pearls put together. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb, and with their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their tongues, whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is different thoughts and different verses pulled together, and, and it's strung together, and it's a string of pearls. And so we don't take just the beautiful pearls of Scripture and throw them out to people who are just going to reject and, and resist these sorts of things. Now, that particular string of pearls is very condemning for the self-righteous person 
telling them that their mouth, which they love to hear themselves speak out of, is actually under the tongue, is the poison of, of an asp. You know, this is something that could be very uh, awakening for them, and you hope that it is. But the gospel needs to go to people who have hearts that have been plowed and are prepared to hear the good news. Until that, the word of God needs to be a burden upon their heart until they turn in faith towards God. And that's why I kind of just feel that he's speaking towards the Pharisees here, and he may even be letting them think that is Jesus calling us dogs and swine. We represent the clean, cleanliness. We, we represent the cleanliness and holiness of God in our, our political station that we sit in, that we call a religion. And so he's warning people, though. Maybe the warning was to those sitting in the crowd who were getting it and they're starting to understand and they're like, now, what do I do about that Pharisee over there? Is he, if I bring him these, these scriptural truths, is he going to tear me in two? We don't know exactly, but it is a good thing to remember that uh, when we take the word of God to someone, there's a good chance that they'll want to tear us in two, and uh, it's an indicator of who they are. Now, if it's someone that you love in your family, you keep praying for them and you, you share with them when you're given the opportunity. But we have the opportunity in, in this to be a self-examiner or one who tears to pieces. And then Jesus gives, I feel that uh, this is just a call to repentance to the people at that time. You may be a Pharisee, you may be looking with lust, you may have adultery in your heart, you may be murderer in your heart, you, you maybe don't rise up to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you maybe you don't pray, maybe you're having a hard time calling this being that Jesus is talking about, Father, God, that you're having a hard time thinking you can just cry out to him and say, Father. And so he says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. And there's no, there's no maybe. If you ask God, you'll receive. If you seek God, you will find. And if you knock, God will open to you his, his will, his grace, Jesus says he will by no means turn away anyone who comes to him by faith. And that's a beautiful thing. This God that Jesus introduces to the people, this Father in heaven who makes his face to shine on the just and the unjust alike, he is the God that if you seek him honestly, the Pharisees that are hearing this exhortation, if they would at that moment have said, oh God, I've been such a critical such a judgmental, such a self-righteous, self-seeking, trying to serve mammon and God at the same time, wanting to be known as a keeper of the law and a judge, but yet I'm actually just heaping condemnation on myself by increasing the burden upon the people. That At that moment, if they would say, God, I need your forgiveness, guess what? He would give it. It's a, just an amazing thing, and it's progressive. We see there, ask and seek and knock. And if you do those things, everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. And then Jesus gives an illustration now, and, and it makes you think, okay, so all of humanity in their own self is, is evil, okay, according to Jesus' illustration here. And... Is he specifically talking to the Pharisees and scribes and hypocrites again? Let's read in verse 9. Or, what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? It's kind of funny. Daddy, I'm hungry. Well, there's a rock. Or, verse 10, if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Yeah, serpent. Anyways, if you then, being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, 
whatever you want men to do. Well, let's let's look at that teeny bit more, I guess. He calls the people hearing this, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven? Now, God, of course, is not evil, and he gives good gifts. And again, just that exhortation, that admonishment for us, that hope that we truly will believe these words, that if we need something from God, we can just say, God, I need you to save me from today. I need you to save me in this situation. I need to say, even, this, this is a thought I forgot I wanted to talk about. Even if you made your own bed, right? You made it, you have to sleep in it, that statement. You know, I, those Christians, <laughs> they just need some tough love. You know, maybe they just need love uh, more than anything else. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a difficult place that we feel like we can stand in the place of a judge because we don't like what someone's doing and uh, not extend to them, just simply extend to them the grace that God says, now, Jesus says, now be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, right? We are to do these, these same things. And even if a son and us being evil, okay, asks and we give them good gifts, you know, we are to do the same. We are to be reciprocating good to people and, and not evil. So just remember, our Father in heaven, he wants to give good things to those who ask him. And again, the most important thing that you can ask God is for the forgiveness of your sins. The most important thing you can ask God is for the righteousness of Christ to be granted to you by faith in trusting in what Jesus did on the cross for you at Calvary 2,000 years ago. That's the most important thing you can ask God. Everything upon that, everything on top of that is just additional blessings. If you, if you do not ask God um, to grant his righteousness to you, uh, then when you stand before him, you won't have what it takes to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we need his forgiveness, and that forgiveness was procured for all of humanity on the cross, and all he's saying is ask, just ask. Um, and that asking will be in faith, of course. So the Bible doesn't say just ask. It's uh, have faith in God, have faith in repentance, faith in Jesus Christ and repentance towards God. So this is just the common courtesy that God would expect people to do, and that's why he says in verse 12, therefore, because of this, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, we know this as the golden rule, whatever a man does unto you, do also to to him, excuse me, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Um, Jesus is saying, how would you like to be treated? And this is what you're supposed to do to others. You're supposed to love others as you would love your own self. Now, every other religion out there says this that, that other way. Do to people what they would do to you or something like that. You know, it just, it's just don't harm someone if you wouldn't want them to harm you. Instead of do good to others that you would want them to do for you. So the life of Christianity is, is shown with um, the invention of that new Greek New Testament word for love, agape, right? Where it's a charitable love or it's a giving love where you go out of your way to do something for someone else. And uh, that's what God wants to do. That's why he's able to say, ask and seek and knock. And if you do, it will be given and opened to you. And so the golden rule comes in the context of not being a Pharisee because right, right there at the end of the golden rule, he says, for this is the law and prophets. Now, the religious person would have said, we have to judge, we have to condemn, we have to separate and put out and look down upon because of the law. But the law was not given for that. The law was to do unto others as you'd have them to do unto you, or as it says in 1 Timothy 1, 5. Now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith, okay? So, and then Timothy says, and some people have strayed, uh, being uh, strayed away into idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, but not understanding neither, neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. So, Old Testament 
The Pharisees, a lot of the time, it seems that they weren't understanding why God gave the law. But therefore, about the law, verse 12, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and prophets. So the law wasn't given <laughs> to give people an opportunity to judge, right? It was given to judge yourself. And that should bring about humility and, uh, and then a peace with God and then a peace with with men, as the first and greatest commandment says, uh, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So, verse 13, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. That's very sad news. There are many who will enter into the wide gate and go into destruction. Uh, Jesus says to enter by the narrow gate. Jesus will tell us that he is the door in in which we enter in by. Um, The the, uh, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter in by it because narrow is is the gate. I'm having a hard time reading that, sorry. And difficult is the way, or narrow is the way, the King James would say, which is a better translation. Narrow is the gate, and narrow is the way by which leads to life, and there, is, there are few who find it. So he's really telling us a very stark and, and kind of painful truth of all of the people that you know who claim to be Christians, and they have bad fruit in their life. You go, their tree seems to bear bad fruit. They may be walking down the wide path, and they might like the idea of Christianity. We don't know that. We, we continue to love people, and if given an opportunity to apply uh, the salve of God's word in, in a measure that brings the gospel to bear on their, their heart, then this is something we need to do. But he said that there are many who will go to destruction, and there are few who will find the narrow way. And Jesus, of course, is that narrow way because he is, as John fourteen six says, the way, the truth, and the life that no man comes to the Father but by him. Now, isn't that a wonderful assurance that there is only one way to get to to heaven? We don't need to choose which way is going to work best for us. Just surrender all the searching and just turn all of your energy and focus towards the Bible, especially in the light of the days that we live in today. Turn all of your focus to walk down that narrow path, to go through the narrow gate and just say, God, how can I serve you completely and utterly and, and uh, fully with the remainder of my life, which in the light of the way things are today, it could be a very short remainder. So, strong exhortation. There are few who find it. And that is very, very frightening. And then Jesus has another warning of danger for those who do find it, those who are walking along the path uh, and they they see that cross, if you will, as in the story of Pilgrim's Progress, when Christian goes there with that burden and he, he enters in through the narrow gate by bowing at the cross and laying down his burden there because Jesus is more than willing and capable to take our burden. But those who find the way, there's a warning for them in verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So there's going to be people, I believe there are so many of them today, they will be a false prophet, so not just a false teacher, they will be someone who stands uh, in in a place where they're bringing something new, okay? Uh, Just got to be really careful about that. Um, They'll want to bring new things all the time. I love bringing new thoughts and better, deeper understanding of the scriptures you know, each time that I teach something, uh, but it has to just be the scriptures as, as there are those about four different verses uh, that we need to remember. Um, uh, I, I didn't think about this in advance. Um, not to think above what is written, Jesus says. Uh, we also need to, uh, hmm, oh well. Well, Revelation nineteen ten says that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And uh, there's just a few different things in the Bible. Oh yeah, Jesus says that the scriptures can't be broken and not to think above what is written. 
the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, right? The, the spirit's always going to testify of Jesus, not other things or or uh, whatever whatever their vision was. Well, anyways, there's going to be false prophets, and I believe that we've got several plenties of those, heaps and heaps, um, and they will come to you in sheep's clothing. They will appear to be a, a sheep, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. Now, what's one of the indicators that a sheep is a ravenous wolf? It will have a really long, fluffy tail, okay? Uh, that's just being silliness. It will not have a uh, diet of vegetables and grasses. It will have the diet of sheep, right? It will want to devour sheep. It will want to have sheep people as, uh, as their possession. They control them. They lead them. They want to have this title of being uh, powerful, and uh, they will consume the people that they are supposedly leading. They won't be like a sheep. They won't be like a shepherd. They will be like a wolf. Now, it's interesting. As far as I understand it, wolves are the only, other than humans, um, some humans, are the only mammal that kills just for practice, okay? They will take their young wolves out, and they will just take down an animal and kill it, and then go do another one, and uh, they'll ravage an entire herd of animals just for practice. So, wolves enjoy the hunt. So uh, watch out, two things, watch out for wolves and make sure you're not a wolf. Um, for some reason, people uh, just get it in them that uh, they really want to be well known uh, for being some sort of a, a Bible person, especially a prophet, um, or today, a lot of people want to be apostles. So just make sure that that's not your, um, your ilk and, and not your calling, right? If it's a calling, seek the Lord and, and, and do that. But verse 16, you will know them by their fruits, okay? So they're going to bear things in their life that you go, huh, that's a little interesting. This person says they are a pastor, but yet they're calling themselves an apostle. Um, this person says they are an, a pastor, but they aren't fitting the biblical model of a pastor. This person says they are uh, a pastor or a church leader, but instead of giving they are taking. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit, okay? Bingo. That's all there is to it. When he told us not to judge in verse 1, he was meaning don't be critical. He is not saying don't be discerning. So if you look at the fruit in someone's life and it's bad, if they've walked away from the faith and it's been more than a year and they're, they're bearing bad fruit. I, I just kind of throw that year thing in there because most trees bear fruit once a year. If, you've, if they've been given time to repent and they've been talked to like a Matthew 18 scenario and yet they're not coming back and there's bad fruit, that's not a good thing. What I would recommend is treat them as if they haven't understood the gospel unto salvation yet. Find a way to bring the gospel to bear on their heart. Verse 18, and a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit, okay? It's just against the nature. If God saves someone, they will bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Okay, just remember that. <laughs> When you hear bad things about certain ministries, especially some of the big televangelists and such, um, and, and just use some discernment, that's all. Just use some discernment out there. There's plenty, there are so many good ministries that uh, people can you know, log on to and listen to, read their writings, and it's good, and it's going to be edifying, and it's safe. You don't need to go after the most spectacular, wow horrific sort of people who are always trying to just, you know, stir the pot, check out the fruit, and if the fruit is rotten, then do not partake of it. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, now this is speaking of these, these false prophets and many others, no, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Okay, so again, the highest accomplishment of the Christian life is obedience 
to God, okay? In verse 21, we find that there are a group of people who will be at, this is the great white throne judgment. This is not the Bemis seat where Christians are awarded for their faithfulness and wood, hay, and stubble burns away. This is the great white throne judgment where they will stand before him and they will emphatically call him Lord. That's why it's twice in the Greek here. Not everyone will say to me, Lord, Lord. They believe themselves to be Christians, but what they were believing is a false version of Christianity. We need to make sure that our Christian faith is based completely upon the word and not traditions and not show and not signs and wonders. We'll get to that in just a second. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. There is a a lack of emphasis on just obedience to God. Obedience to God is the highest expression that you trust him to. That is the full expression of your faith when you obey God. God, when in the midst of an opportunity to react or to sin, you say, God's word says this, and you obey, that is a great expression of saying, God, I love you more than this opportunity to to fulfill my flesh. Because no man can serve both God and mammon. And when we serve our flesh, we are not serving God. And so, we need to do the will of our Father in heaven. And uh, there's going to be many in that day who say, Lord, Lord. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Okay, it's not like, eh, they kind of fell away, their work, you know, if you're, if you're uh, thinking someone can lose their salvation, that kind of works uh, works righteousness, um, he, he never knew them, okay? They were never born again. And he says to them, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Again, so we have lawlessness here, and uh, this is a, a very big subject, um, especially in, in today's world. Today's world, we see so much that the world is turned upside down. Bitter is called sweet, and sweet is called bitter. Right is called wrong, and wrong is called right. Right. And uh, when, when Isaiah says that, he says, and they, they, they just don't realize, they, they think that they're doing what's right in their own eyes. And so there is a very big push, even in the church, uh, for carnality to be called uh, liberty. And uh, it's not a good thing. Anyways, he says, depart from me, for I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness, and it doesn't mean that they're necessarily doing all sorts of carnal things, but usually that is the case, and it's something that they do secretly on a regular basis. They're bearing bad fruit. But the main thing that they're doing, it kind of takes you back to uh, 1 Kings, uh, or 1 Samuel. Oh, no, 1 Samuel. I um, forget where now. Is that about verse, chapter 14? Where Samuel says, hey, Samuel, or uh, King Saul, you should have killed uh, all of the Amalekites. Right, I told you to utterly destroy them, and yet now you've left King uh, Amalek alive, and uh, and that's going to be a bad thing in the future. But he says um, that disobedience is as the sin of witchcraft. Right, a rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and that's what this is boiling down to. If someone, if they go, well, I like Christianity, but I'm going to do these things that. Uh, are twisting the word of God, that's lawlessness. And Matthew 24, 12 says, lawlessness will abound in the end times. That will be an indicator that we are in the end times and lawlessness will abound because of the love of many will wax cold. When he says love there, that's the word agape. Christians aren't loving God properly with obedience and so why, why should the rest of the world follow along if the Christians don't love their own God? And so we have to be very careful in the days that we live. Um, and the, the warning is, is so bright and blaring. Jesus saying to a large group of people, I never knew you. 
And so they practice lawlessness. So now I just, I know there's church groups out there. I know there's so many denominations that are just so into um, what, what appears to me to just lawlessness. You, if you're a leader in those groups, you're a wolf, right? And you need to stop it. But if, if someone's out there and you're part of one of these groups and you can tell that the, the, the way that worship goes forth and, and things like that, that it's about the flesh, it's about the exaltation of man, the elevation of your deeds and your abilities, this is lawlessness. This is a fruitless deed. This is something that is very carnal and you need to run from it and you need to seek the Lord and just seek his purity and his holiness and let his Holy Spirit confirm to you that you can seek him, that you can call out on him, you can knock, and he will open that door of forgiveness and repentance to you. So let's just read that again, and I'll, I'll move on to verse 24. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice. They're good at it. They're practicing lawlessness. Now, notice, I want to kind of like just shine a little bit of light without sitting name and names. Um, <laughs> but notice one of the descriptive things here that tells us what they, they'll do. They, they will have done many signs and wonders. They've cast out demons in your name and they've done many wonders in your name but yet it must not be his name because he never knew them, all right? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us about uh, the great ap apostasia, the falling away, where people fall away. And it's an end, end time indicator of uh, one of the, one of the uh, birth pangs, one of the perilous things that will be coming upon the earth as we get closer and closer to the tribulation. And the falling away, the departure from the faith will be one of the things that um, lets the world go lawless and love to wax cold, Matthew 24, 12. But the indicator that is very interesting to me from this passage of Scripture is in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, okay? Speaking about the, the restrainer is going to be removed. That's the church being raptured out. But he says that the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, okay? So there's this lawless one coming, right? Jesus says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This lawless one is coming. He cannot be revealed until the church is raptured out of the way. But the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, okay? With all power, signs, and lying wonders. Now, notice the similarities there. Have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Now, it's very frightening to think that there's people out there who are doing this purely in the power of the kundalini spirit, and not the Holy Spirit. They are being controlled with convulsive, what they would call prophesying or being filled with the Spirit, but they're actually prophesying through the power and the working and the signs of Satan. Okay, Very, very, very different from what it should be. So in the days that we live, I can turn on YouTube and I can watch church services from these places on a regular basis. Make sure that you are not involved in a church that practices lawlessness, that calls out emphatically, Lord, Lord, but yet you didn't know him because you are seeking after signs and wonders and all power that was coming from Satan instead of from Jesus. Verse 24, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, and does them, I will liken him to wise to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. Now, there's lots of different sermons on this particular section of Scripture here, and it's all about having a good, faithful walk and all this stuff, and it's really about being judged. Are, are, if you're, are you on the rock of Jesus Christ, or are you standing on sifting sand? 
Because judgment is coming, there's going to be a day when many stand before him and say, Lord, Lord. There's going to be a, a differentiation between those who take the wide path and those who take the narrow path, okay? And Jesus is trying to make this clear. He's saying it to the Pharisees, but he's also saying it to the church today that uh, we need to choose the Lord and choose faith and choose obedience over power and signs and wonders and critical judgmentalism, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, whoever says um, these sayings of mine and does them, okay, the person who obeys, I will liken him to the wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Okay, it's founded on Jesus. But everyone who hears the sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a, the foolish man who's built his house on the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and the house fell and great was its fall. Jesus uses those words because he's saying that the fall of a soul into damnation, especially one who, who thought they were doing these things, but deep down inside, they knew that they were doing it for the wrong reason. How great is that fall? You see, there is such a difference between the works of the flesh that look like religion, that might give you fame and fortune, and there's such a difference between just finding yourself standing upon the rock, which is Christ. You see, faith in Jesus. So, you know, just if you... If you I would really encourage you today uh, to read the stories of King David, the accounts of King David, and how he always trusted the Lord to deliver him. David had faith, and we're going to need that kind of faith. And in our state alone, if you do not have your vaccine, oh, if you don't have that by October 18th, your job ends, okay? It's, it's, it's a line in the sand that's not a godly line at all. And it's creating a place for people to have the opportunity to trust God to provide for them, to stand on the rock. Things are changing. Things are moving so quickly towards a, a one-world government, you know, Revelation chapter 13, that you can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast. We can see how this prototype is just being forced upon us so powerfully that people do not, they're not given a choice. You know, the phrase, my body, my choice. Um, those sorts of things, they don't count anymore for an experimental activity. And it's, it's very frightening in so many ways of what the consequences of this may be. But we are told that if we've built our house on the rock, that if our life is built upon Jesus Christ and we truly trust in him and we have faith in him and hope in him, then we will stand through the storm. And even if a Christian's life is lost, because they stood for Jesus Christ, because they stood for what was right from the scriptures. There's no great was his fall, right? It's a great rejoicing instead when you enter into the kingdom of heaven. We need to express more than ever our faith in God through Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that we are in God's word and understanding it and able to suppress in us the, the fears that bring about anxieties, the fears that bring about uh, trepidation and things in our life that just say, you are in so much trouble. What are you going to do? We just need to be able to lay down our, our issues at the foot of the cross and just say, Lord, we, I trust you. And it's good because Jesus tells us that everyone who asks receives. And everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, it will be open to him. We have a God who responds to our needs. We have a God who cares. We have a God who demonstrated his own love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We have a God who wants to show himself strong in us, that as 
opportunity for persecution and trials come our way, that we stand upon what is correct and right in God's eyes, that we obey, not sacrifice, that we obey God and we just stand by faith in what he has said. And, and we can do that because Jesus is so authoritative, as it says in verse 28. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Jesus has authority, and he promises us that if we cry out in his name, he will hear us, and he will respond, and he will move. I know a lot of us out there today, we might be sick, we might be tired, we might be burdened, we might be stressed, we might be challenged. But if we call out on the name of the Lord, he will hear and he will save and he will glorify his name through your obedience, right? The highest, highest achievement in the Christian's life is to obey the word of God. So Father, I just pray, Lord, your blessing on us, um, God, that this word would be received and uh, God, that we would have faith to obey the word of God. God, that we would have wisdom and energy, Lord, in this day, God, to study your word, to be workmen um, who need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, that we would know what your word says and be able to apply it in our own life, Lord, that we are able to obey it in that day. And having done all the stand, that we would stand there for us. So we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would just Lead us, Lord, in, in those paths of righteousness for your name's sake, God, and we would be able to testify truly and boldly at the goodness of God as we see you um, deliver us and provide for us. And we pray your blessing on us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.